Good evening. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. This year's scripture readings have all focused on light, the theme of light. We heard it repeatedly during the Christmas season. We heard it again in last Sunday's first reading. And tonight we will hear it in the first reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah and in the gospel reading from St. Matthew. The people who walked or dwelt or sat in darkness have seen a great light. So maybe the question we need to ask is this. What is the darkness that still dwells in our lives? And to what light is Jesus calling us when today's gospel, he says, repent and believe in the good news. Let us call to mind our faults and failings and ask his mercy and forgiveness. Lord Jesus, you called your disciples to preach the kingdom of God. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you call us to walk and live in your way of love. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are the light that scatters the darkness. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us. May he forgive us our sins, and may he bring us to life everlasting. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty, ever-living God, direct our actions according to your good pleasure, 
that in the name of your beloved Son, we may abound in good works. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. First, the Lord degraded the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the end, he has glorified the seaward road, the land west of the Jordan, the district of the Gentiles. Anguish has taken wing, dispelled is darkness, for there is no gloom where but now there was distress. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwelt in the land of gloom, a light has shone. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing. As they rejoice before you as at the harvest, as people make merry when dividing spoils. For the yoke that burdened them the pole on their shoulder, and the rod of their taskmaster you have smashed, as on the day of Midian. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same person. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. I mean that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with the wisdom of human eloquence, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what had been said through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. On those dwelling in a land overshadowed by death, light has arisen. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother, Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. He walked along from there and saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. He went around all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. You, Lord 
at birth, he was given the name Simon. His father was named John. So around the Sea of Galilee, he grew up as Simon bar Jonah, which in English means Simon, son of John. The modern version of that name would be Simon Johnson. But by the time St. Matthew wrote his gospel, he had taken on a new identity. He was now known as Peter, which as we all know means rock. That was a description of his character. He was a solid man. You could count on him and you would know that he would not let you down. In some sense, that happens to all of us. We were once nothing more than the baby boy or the baby girl of our parents. We had little or no personal identity. I was the Bradley baby, you were the Johnson baby, or the Jones baby. We had little or no personal identity, and we were just known as the little baby boy or the little baby girl. And that was pretty much the whole story of you and me. But with the passing of time, we began to acquire an identity of our own. We began to stand for something. There was a suggestiveness to our lives. We were timid or we were confident. We were polite or rude. And whenever people saw us or heard of us, they thought of those qualities. Of course, growing children change from day to day, sometimes even hour to hour. One moment they are pleasant, and the next moment they are unpleasant. But by the time we become adults, our lives have taken shape. And in the minds of the people who know us, we stand for something. Simon was a fisherman. Whenever people thought of him, the fishing business came to mind. But all of that changed for him. He was still a fisherman, but instead of dragging fish into a boat, he was drawing people to the cause of Jesus Christ. And he became known as a representative of Jesus Christ, both in word and in deed. He is still known for that. In fact, it is almost impossible for you and me to think of Peter without thinking of Jesus Christ. This truth does not apply just to people in the Bible. It is part of our everyday lives. Think of a person you know and see how quickly other thoughts come to your mind. You think of one and you think of greed. You think of another and you think of generosity. Some people inspire thoughts of kindness. Others conjure images of unkindness. It is impossible to know people well without thinking of what they stand for. And that confronts you and me with a very important question. What comes to people's minds when they think of us? To obsess with that question would be foolish, but to care about it would be wise. Of course, most people never think about us at all. As someone once said, we would not worry so much about what people think of us if we only knew how seldom they do. But some people cannot keep from thinking about us because they live with us every day. And in their thoughts, we are more than names and faces. We are qualities of character. We are patient or impatient. We are caring or indifferent. 
We are reliable or unpredictable. Friends and family can count on us or else they always have an alternative plan. No higher honor can come to men and women than to be trusted and respected by the people who know them best. When your children think of you, what else comes to mind? Do they feel safe and cherished, or do they feel tolerated and insecure? When your wife hears you as you're coming home from work, does she greet you with open arms, or does she approach you with caution, wondering what mood he might be in today? You see, your real worth and mine is not in ourselves alone. It is also in what we stand for. And the good news of all of this is that the least of us can stand for the greatest things. Think of those things that are indispensable to life. What are they? One is water. Every living thing depends upon water. Without it, no plant or animal could survive for very long. Our water comes from five great oceans, but the smallest mountain stream represents the same necessity as the biggest ocean. Another is light. Without it, darkness would cover the earth. Nothing would grow, and life as we know it would be impossible. Our primary source of light is the sun, but a small candle represents the same necessity. And sometimes a candle can go where the sun cannot go and do what the sun cannot do. That same thought applies in the realm of character. Honesty is indispensable in life. A society cannot live on lies. Truth is as necessary as water and light. Few things are more needed in public office than people who have the courage to tell the truth. But a child in school refusing to cheat on a test can represent the same kind of indispensable quality. Another is goodwill. When goodwill breaks down in a society, common human decencies are lost, and cruelty rules the day. No society can thrive or even survive without a spirit of goodwill. You and I, of course, have no control over the warring factions of the world, but we cannot keep them we cannot keep them from senseless slaughters. But in our homes and in our communities, we can be representatives of goodwill. That is a question that none of us can escape. So what are we standing for? It is a foregone fact that we are standing for something. And the glory or shame of our lives depends upon what that something is. Jesus stood for the kingdom of heaven. He preached it and lived it. His words and deeds spoke of life at its best. In our gospel reading today, four simple fishermen, Peter and Andrew, James and John, chose to stand with Jesus. And they too became representatives of the kingdom of heaven. They were adventurers who were eager to test themselves in a cause greater than themselves. They readily abandoned their fishing nets to take part in a heavenly conquest. And that same option is available to you and me. Small and unimpressive though our lives may be, we can stand for the very best. In a sense, we human beings are like flagpoles. Some are very tall and prominent. Others are quite small. 
But the worth of a flagpole is not in its size, but in the colors that it flies. A short and bent flagpole holding up a flag of freedom has more value than a towering pole with the Nazi swastika on its banner. When my life is finished, I want to be able to say to myself something like this. I might not have been the tallest or the straightest flagpole, but I am proud of the colors that I flew. His name was Simon, but he became known as Peter. It spoke of the cause he represented. What are we standing for? That is the question which each one of us must answer for ourselves. Let us pray. For our church, as we proclaim Jesus' call to repentance, that we may show the world what it means to be true disciples through the witness of our lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in authority, that they may treat citizens and employees justly and with dignity. We pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from lack of adequate food, clothing, and shelter, that they may be blessed by the compassion and generosity of others. We pray to the Lord. Lord For the eventual overturn of Roe versus Wade, that our government may realize and defend the dignity and sanctity of each human life. We pray to the Lord. For all those who hear Jesus' call to ordained and religious ministry, that they may receive the support of their families, loved ones, and friends, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear that God may hear the prayers in our hearts and those in our intentions book. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear and we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who is our risen Lord and our brother forever and ever. Amen.
Pray with me, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours might be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. Accept our offerings, O Lord, we pray, and in sanctifying them, grant that they may profit us for salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of times and seasons. You formed us in your own image and set us over the whole world in all its wonder to rule in your name over all you have made and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so with all the angels and saints in heaven, we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and giving thanks, he gave the blessing and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat from it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, 
and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. Joseph, her husband, with the blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, your servant Pope Francis and our Bishop William, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. And to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity, accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Grant, we pray, almighty God, that receiving the grace by which you bring us to new life, we may always glory in your gift of faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. And may almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Go in peace. If you're retired and worried about interest rates, did you know that a 75-year-old person can earn a fixed rate of 7.1% on a charitable contribution? It's called a charitable gift annuity, and the money provides the donor with some very generous income tax deductions, and then someday that money will produce an income for your parish, a school, this television ministry, or any ministry that you designate that serves the Catholic Church of Western Kentucky. Call to find out how a charitable gift annuity can assure you a guaranteed high rate of interest while you are alive and then someday serve the Catholic Church. Far from major cities and bustling suburbs, there's an invisible Catholic Church in America. A church where parishes are remote and poor. But Catholics, though few in numbers, are rich in spirit, firm in their desire to maintain their faith. Most Catholics know little about this invisible church. It is Mission America. Most Catholics, when they think of missions, think of foreign missions. The reality is that certain parts of the United States are as in much dire need as certain parts of Africa or China. To receive Extension Magazine free of charge, call 1-888-47-FAITH. That's 1-888-47-FAITH or visit us at www.catholicextension.org.